listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio Welcome to the X-Zone A place where fact is fiction And fiction is reality Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell And welcome all to the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, and our main radio website where you can listen to past editions of the Exxon. You can find out what we've done, what we're doing, and what we will be doing in the future at radio. Dot com And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and Exxon Broadcast Network, and in Europe on Radio X. My guest uh, this hour, Exxon Nation, is Buddy Thayer. He founded Ocean State Paranormal in uh, 2012, but he had investigated uh, previously with a now defunct group. However, he did have the benefit of learning from a former member of TAPS, uh, who was not a cast member, but had traveled with the team to Tombstone and worked on the sidelines but, and learned, uh, learned from Grant and Jason. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to bring our guest on now, Buddy Thayer. Welcome to the X-Zone. Hey, how you doing? We're doing great, thanks, Buddy. Thanks for joining us. And tell us a little bit about yourself and what it was in your life, Buddy, that put you on this path to finding out the questions, the answers to the questions, I should say, that so many people are asking about the paranormal these days. Uh, well, you know, you know, um, back in I'd say 2008, I was working in a group home in uh, Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I had never really believed in ghosts. I kind of did. I kind of like it, it was a nice idea, but, but um, I, I never. It, believing for me was see, seeing for me is believing. So I, I didn't never saw anything, never experienced anything. So I really couldn't say, yeah, I believe in ghosts or not. So anyway, I'm working in this group home. I'm working the overnight shift, and um, there's staff that are telling me that I work with that, that ask me if I have any ghost stories. Telling me their ghost stories, I'm like, oh my god, this is uh, it's gonna play with my mind. So I try and block it out. So I work the overnight. It's just me. There's five kids there, and kids are waking up in the middle of the night, and they're telling me about seeing like people in their rooms. They're seeing a man in their rooms, and I'm just saying to them, no, you're having a bad dream. This is like, you know, like your mind is playing tricks with you. <laughs> um, this isn't real. Just go back to bed. And they go back to bed. I try to soothe them, and um. They, they sleep they sleep with your kids in a bedroom, so they have a, a motion sensor on the floor. So when the kid got up out of bed, you'd hear the motion sensor. You know the kid was getting out of bed. So he'd go to the bathroom. He'd help him do whatever. Sure. And it's in the back bed. Um, so one night I was putting the dishes away. It was about 4 a.m., and I heard the motion sensor go off, and I turned around to the bedroom behind me, and I saw a figure coming out of the bedroom. The figure walked right right in front of my face and disappeared. Immediately, I was incredibly terrified. Um, I've never been so scared in my life. And from that moment for about the next four months from that day on, it was every single night that I worked, there was something that was happening. Whether I'd be touched, I'd hear voices, I'd hear footsteps, I'd hear people upstairs and there'd be no one upstairs. Um, it was just... So, so it was that experience that led me into... Um, joining a, a paranormal group. So I would imagine from that moment on, you were a believer. Absolutely, firm believer. There's no way I could explain um, a figure just walking in front of me and, and absolutely disappearing right before my eyes. Wow. You and I have to take a break, buddy. Please stand okay. by. Exo Nation, our guest this hour is Buddy Thayer. He is with and founded Ocean State Paranormal. Their website is... Buddy, what's your website? Uh, um, the website is not up and running yet. We still run off of Facebook. So, facebook.com uh, slash Ocean State Paranormal. There you go, Exxon. have all of our stuff in there. All right, there you go, Exxon Nation. You heard it right from Buddy's lips. And when we come back, we're going to be investigating the paranormal and strange, weird occurrences that Buddy and his group, Ocean State Paranormal, have investigated. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, you can always send an email to me right here in the Exxon simply by addressing your emails to exxon at exxonradiotv.com. I am Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. 
As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you are able to give factual information, and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. Back everyone, Buddy Thayer is our special guest. Buddy is the founder of Ocean State Paranormal in Rhode Island. And uh, if you'd like to visit their Facebook page, it's facebook.com forward slash open state paranormal. Buddy, um, do you believe in demonic entities as well as spirits, ghosts, and, and you know, the regular run of the mill paranormal stuff? Yeah, you know, um, we had a case. Of the third of that, I, I believe that there's something definitely negative. I can't, mm-hmm. I won't label it demonic or um, anything like that. That's more of a religious uh, connotation, but definitely. Um, we had a case going back, uh, this is about 2013. Um, she was referred to us at a, a paranormal conference that mm-hmm. we were at, and um, it was a, it was a woman, she was about in her 30s. She was Dominican. She lived in Providence. Um, her mother lived with her. Her mother was about 56, 57. And then they had their, their niece living with them who was about, um, I'd say she was eight, nine months old. Okay? Yeah. So um, the woman was experienced, exper- had experiences of like seeing people in her house, um, seeing faces in the window, seeing faces in the mirror, feeling something touch her at night, something touch her sex at night. Um, so we went in there and we did the full investigation and we did a history beforehand, of course. And um, we had certain EVPs like, for example, get the F out or this is my house several times. Hmm. So I thought that was kind of odd. Um, so we had a medium come in with us. We actually had two mediums come in with us. And uh, the first time they did the, the first floor of the, of the house, and they, they experienced a few um, human entities, say. And it, it, it was that of an older man and his two daughters. 
and how they lived there all their lives. And I did the history, so it made sense to what they were what they were talking about. Um, so they they passed, they crossed them over apparently, and that was all, all. And then the woman, we left the woman, and she had said uh, nothing bad had been happening. And every day we talked to her, and um, she reported nothing paranormal. And then it was five days later. And she's like, oh, my God, it started again, and it started up even worse. And uh, it's it's uh, it's coming after, like, it's the baby's crying at night, and my mother's starting to, like, my mother, the mother didn't believe in it, anything at all. She was very religious. But then stuff started happening and couldn't explain. So we, we came back in with the medium, and we, we hadn't going down there before. We went down there. Um, we didn't go down there the first time. We investigated down there. We had strange EVPs down there. But the, initially, the psychics didn't believe the basement had anything to hold, so we didn't go down the first time. The second time we went down, and they started saying that there's something demonic. They they were both of the Christian religion, so they were using the term demons. Mm-hmm. They were described what looked like. They were in the corner, and I'm like, all right, I'm as that sage and they're talking about this, I'm just kind of walking them. I'm thinking to myself, I'm not seeing anything. I'm not hearing anything. I'm, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, as we turn around and walk, go upstairs, the medium that's standing behind me, she, she let out a gash and a scream. She turned around and she raised her shirt and she had uh, three uh, scratch marks going down her back. Uh, the red, they were just like like they just happened. Obviously, um, I had I have to this day I have no way to explain. How, how she got those scratches on her back. Um, so we went upstairs. We, we ended up talking to the client for a few minutes. We left, and I contacted a um, demonologist by the name of Joe Andre. Uh He came down and did a house blessing. Um, now, that itself was kind of surreal. There was a lot of, like, things I couldn't explain. It's like temperature change, mm-hmm. and there was we were all experiencing, like, weird, like, pains... Specifically in our back, there was um, Joe, his partner, the client, and me and my um, one of my assistants. And we were just there basically to, to observe. And it was a lot of weird stuff happened. We were, I was hearing voices myself, like people in the other room, but there was no one there. So it was just um, from that point on, Joe took the case, um, the demonologist, and he worked with the client. And um, we don't, we, we just tend not to do that anymore because. I'm a ghost guy. I love the ghosts. I love, um, you know, tying the history into 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 the the present. But mm-hmm. that's uh, a little bit more than I'm I'm into. So what is what is the what is the thrill that ghost hunters or ghost researchers get? Why do you guys do what you do? I, I don't know. I I've, I've always loved history. So to be able to tie in the to be able to go somewhere that's say historical, for example. And talk about somebody who was actually living there and buried there, and have them come forward and say yes, and say, "Oh, that was me," mm-hmm. or "I did that." You know, it just—it absolutely blows my mind. Why do you think that some of these spirits hang behind and that they don't progress to the next stage uh, towards the light? Well, you know, in in. Ocean State Paranormal, we do a lot of residential cases. So a lot of the times, I'll, I experience or what I, what we can theorize as, a, 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 so a family, uh, a, a man and a woman get married, mm-hmm. and they buy a house, and they have like two or three kids, and they raise their kids in the house, and the kids go on and they go off to school, and then their kids get married, and this couple lives in this house all their lives. They, they get old, and then eventually they die in this house. This is the place that they love the most throughout their whole lives, where everything good in their lives happened in this house and around this house. So, of course, naturally, maybe they're going to want to hang out at this house after they pass. I don't know. That's that's my best guess. Maybe Or maybe they have something that they feel they should hang on for. Or maybe they feel guilty about what they did in life, and that's why they're I – don't, I don't – I, I guess tell you. I guess that's the ten million dollar question, huh? Yeah, that's what we're all in it for. Um, what kind of training did you uh, do? You and the the other members of the Ocean State Paranormal have? Um, as far as with 
Ocean State Paranormal. I um I studied history my whole life. I went to college mm-hmm. in history. Um, so research is my primary thing with Ocean State Paranormal. Now, um, before I did Ocean State Paranormal, I was involved with another group, and the gentleman in charge of that group kind of showed me the ropes, the the basics of listening to audio, how to listen, you know, for those really low frequency things that that. You, you end up re-listening to it, and it's it's like usually an EVP or something, you know, or how to look at photographs, how not how not to fool yourself by matrixing something that's not there, like something that's there and making it look like something like a tree looking like a face, you know. It's just it's just the way it grows. Just looking at things with more of a scientific eye. You know, here we are in the year 2016, buddy. Why do you think paranormal investigating is so popular? It hasn't. Is it so popular now because of the TV shows, maybe? But paranormal investigating has been popular the last 200 years. It's in more media, more, um, more, more of a stage for, for the paranormal to be on, you know? So what is going to happen when, you, when paranormal investigators find the evidence they're looking for, whatever that may be? What do they do with it? Um, well, we... Go to sh- we go to shows and conferences presented to the public um, as as evidence of the of the paranormal, I guess you'd say, um, and that's really our goal. And to help out, you know, when we go to residences, we try and help people to uh, either accept that there are ghosts in their house, here's the evidence to prove it, or there aren't ghosts in their house, and here's the evidence to prove it. Um, so that's really what I do right now. When when we go into people's houses, we we look for everything but. Paranormal, because people will look at paranormal, you know, a hundred times to one if they believe it. They'll, they'll want it to be paranormal. How many cases have you and the Ocean State Paranormal Group investigated so far since you've been in uh, on the scene since 2012? Um, we're about to go into case 25. We're about to book case 25, which is going to be in Fall River, Massachusetts. Um, I've each case we've gone to multiple times. Um, I'm, I was talking to case 22 just this evening. We're planning on going back there again. Um, we do historical houses. We go back there a few times. So, I mean, at least close to a hundred investigations, I'd say, um, since 2012. So what are you going to do? Like, I understand that you people go to conferences and that you exchange, you know, you talk to the public about your fines and so on and so forth. But once you've established that it's real, what more can you do, and why do you keep doing it? Well, um, okay, so two falls ago, we started at, at libraries around Rhode Island. We go to libraries to give presentations. We present evidence. Um, right now, that's all I'm really interested in. I don't know if I can I, – I guess I could write a book someday, but mm-hmm. I, don't think, I don't feel like I've had enough experience yet. I feel there's people out there who – are writing books now out of Rhode Island who, who have been doing this for like 40 years. So I, I, I feel that I'm not there yet. Mm-hmm. I'd like to experience a little bit more before I make some theories and conjectures about this field. What kind of equipment do you use? The best equipment for the paranormal investigator is the investigator themselves. You go into a place, mm-hmm. you sit there, you sit, you're quiet, you're listening, your ears are listening for the, the sounds outside the house, outside the site. You know, your smells, you're, you're getting used to, like, how the house creaks or how the building creaks when you're in it. When, you know, during traffic coming by or uh, or whatnot, or people walking up a hallway, actual people walking up a hallway. So yourself, the paranormal investigator themselves is the best tool. After the paranormal investigator, I find um, the, I have a Sony record, digital recorder. Mm-hmm. It cost me maybe 50 bucks at Walmart, and it's the best, I captured the best audio evidence on that by far hands down all right you and i have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour buddy stand by exo nation buddy thayer's our guest this hour he's with uh ocean state paranormal in rhode island in fact buddy is the founder and the historian for the group you can find more about buddy and ocean state paranormal on their facebook page at uh you know facebook.com forward slash open state paranormal ocean state paranormal what did i say Open state. I I thought you said open state, but it's ocean state. Ocean state. Paranormal. 
And uh, Buddy and I will be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. The Exxon, Monday through Friday, is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And once again, we return on the other side with Buddy Thayer from the Ocean State Paranormal Group. Don't go away, Exxon Nation. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried, he mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. <laughs> The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. 
Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genex provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan, dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Dagaronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Buddy Thayer is my guest this hour, Exonation. He is the founder and historian of Ocean State Paranormal. They are in Rhode Island. Uh, tell me, uh, Buddy, where is the creepiest, the most haunted place in all of Rhode Island? Um, I would say the former lad school would probably be the top, the top three at least in, in Rhode Island. And it was a, go, oh, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask you what the history of the place is. Oh, the history of the place. It was founded in the the turn of the ninth, turn of the twentieth century, 
as um, uh, an institution for the, they call it the feeble-minded back in those days, mm -hmm. um, developmentally disabled. It started as that, and then it turned into social pariahs went there, and um, kids guilty of truancy, or kids that stole, or like people who murdered that were underage. They, everybody went there, um, and it, it was became immensely overpopulated. Um, in the seventies, scandals broke out uh, that you know there was atrocities at, at the dental school, and there were atrocities. In, in the residential units um, where people were getting abused or people were getting raped, people were getting buried out in the backyard type situation. Uh, the place finally closed in the 80s and was off limits to anybody for forever. Um, cops would patrol there regularly, which was kind of a good thing because there were dilapidated buildings and people could mm -hmm. get hurt. Um, but we ended up getting a, into that place legally in um, November of 2014 before it was torn down the following spring. And that was absolutely incredible. Tell me, buddy, why do you think these ghosts hang around these places with so many people going through, trying to get EVPs, trying to, you know, uh, make contact with the other side? Why, you know, like, I, I can't un understand, and neither can a lot of listeners, why they keep going to Waverly Hills, they go to the, all, the Gettysburg, you know, like, how can these ghosts just stick around? I, I don't know, but I, I, as I work with people, that's what I do for a living. I work yeah. in psychology, so I see the worst of, of people, and people do the worst things for attention. They seek attention. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the afterlife, they're just seeking attention, and they, they can yeah. get it at places like Waverly, places like Gettysburg, where they're there, and people are there to appreciate them. For the most part, I don't know. Could it be that? Could it be that some of the researchers, or investigators, or or ghost hunters are they themselves who are seeking the attention and manifest these these apparitions and these sounds themselves just to get their little fifteen minutes of fame and glory? Well, you know, I I I got to tell you, I have seen um, like paranormal groups or people mm -hmm. that consider themselves to be paranormal groups, um, completely fake evidence. Really, it would just to. You know, get their own attention. I, I have seen that. That does happen, unfortunately. But what does that what does that do to to groups like yours who are trying to do, you know, do everything the right way, seeking permission, using respect when doing your investigations? How do you how do you feel as someone who takes this very serious when other members of the paranormal community are just fudging their own evidence? Well, um, in certain cases, it, it, it's Laws from getting into certain places because they had one bad experience with one bad group mm -hmm. and they don't want to do it anymore. And they have incredible, you know, historical value or they have incredible paranormal value to offer. They just won't do it anymore just because of small groups like that or groups like that. People just looking for their own attention. So they ruin it for everybody else. It's situations like that. But with us, we prove ourselves by our own, you know, our own merit. So we. The work that we do, we kind of it kind of proves that we're we're in this for the long haul. We're not we're not we're not in this to to, to get attention for ourselves. With over sixteen thousand paranormal investigating groups in the United States today, and that's just those who investigate haunted houses, uh, seeking proof of the afterlife. If you were just to take the sixteen thousand with an average of five people per group. They each group will spend anywhere from 10 to 20 hours a week doing what they enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment that have been purchased by the groups, self-funding. Yep. Over the past, let's say, five years, and yet no one has come up with the smoking gun. How come? I, I don't I, I, Wrong place at the wrong time, I guess. I got um. We, we invested in video equipment about uh, a year and a half ago, and out of the four or five investigations that we've done mm -hmm. with the video equipment, I've watched hundreds of hours of video equipment and just dust, like, roll by, or just, like, you know, a blank room, an empty room for, like, endless hours. It's incredibly boring. But there's one small piece of, I got one small piece of video 
evidence, and it's absolutely incredible. What so is you get it? this one little, you know, one little drop in a, in a huge, huge pond, um, and it, it makes it worthwhile. But um, not everybody's going to get that. I don't, I don't know. It's just uh, we were in the right place at the right time. I think that's all. That's all. It just happened to be somebody walking by, you know, and and we happened to be there with a the video camera. So I think that yeah, people get it every now and again, but it's I don't I don't know. Okay, so do you take your your video footage that you that you feel that you've caught something on and bring it to an expert for an analysis, or do you just say this is the evidence that we've been seeking? I have one piece. I haven't showed it to anybody. We show it at conferences. I haven't. Pre- I won't present it as evidence yet. I just have we one piece that will show it like conferences that we go to. Um, I won't even. I won't post it on the page yet because I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, so let's say let's say somebody calls you up and says, "Hey, buddy, my house is haunted." How do you proceed in your investigation? Well, we look at the, the the client's claims. For example, what you know, what they happen to be, if what what they happen to be experiencing, if they're like, there's all different things. I mm-hmm. I had a I had a woman tell me that she had uh, like demons holding her down at night, mm-hmm. and it comes to find out that she had sleep paralysis. So I look at people's medical history. Look at the psych, you know, their psycho psychological uh, psychological history. Um, if they're on any certain kind of medications, first I'm looking at all the obvious answers, the obvious possibilities or the the rational possibilities before I'm even looking at ghosts. Once those are out of the way and, and none of those can be answered um, logically at all, um, I'll start looking into the history of the, the location, the history of the people that are living there, if they're you know, if they happen to have a record or if they have uh, any personal problems that have been like in the media or whatnot. Um, I'll look at the history of the home. Uh, the history of the property, the people who used to live there, anything, any facts about them that I can put into a question form. We go to the house, we look at the claims, we look at any rational possibilities on site while we're there. We can figure it out. Um, if not, we'll turn the lights off at night. We'll go around with the equipment, only because the equipment, a lot of it has lights on it, you know, and you can see the best when the, when the lights are off. So we do it with the lights off. Um, if we happen to get like, you know, unexpected, like K2 hits, for example, are going to go off if they're around certain electronic, um, applications, like, like a refrigerator or a microwave or a fuse box or anything like that, they're going to go off. But if there's nothing that around, or if there's no wiring around that would cause mm-hmm. a K2 to, to go off to, to show a, a level of EMF, we're going to ask particular trigger questions, um, Hopefully, trigger a response. What kind of questions would you ask? Okay, for example, um, my second case, case, the person who built the house, he was a captain in the Civil War. He was captain of the uh, First Rhode Island Cavalry Division. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, me and the, the woman I was with, we talked about things that, for example, that a cavalry officer would carry into battle. Uh, you know, a flintlock, a cavalry sword. Um, he rode a horse. Um, we were talking back and forth like that. There was an old man's voice that said, I did that. And it was just me and this woman. So there was, I had no explanation. We had this clear as day mm-hmm. voice. You would think the man was in the room with us. So apparently I triggered some kind of response by talking about what he did in the Civil War. And did you get that on tape? Absolutely. That's available on our, on our site. Okay. Do you do your investigations just at night or during the day as well? We have them during the day as well. Um, I have, I've had mixed success. It doesn't. I don't think it really matters daytime and nighttime. I don't think it really matters like one o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the morning. Like some people do it like late, 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 early mm-hmm. hours of the morning. I don't think it matters. So when you go out do the investigation, you gather all the evidence, you bring it back, you review the evidence. And then do do a, a a final report, meet with the client, and discuss we your re- findings. Yeah, we review amongst the whole group, and if we don't all agree on what we think it is, it, it's all all similar or the same. But we won't even present it to the client. If, if it's just a noise or a knock or a tap, we're not going to present it to the client. We're not going to give them any like false hopes or anything. 
Um, if it's going to be paranormal, it's going to be definitely like, here you go. There's no other explanation we have for it. We think it's paranormal. Is see what you think. Okay, so you give them the evidence. What happens then? Um, they can have us come back for another investigation. Um, we can do uh, if they want a cleansing, we can do a cleansing. If they want a medium to come in, we can have a medium come in. Um, if they want a house blessing, we can arrange that for whatever religion they are in. Really, I can't like wave my wand. I don't really know what else mm -hmm. you know to clear a spirit. A medium could do that, I guess. Um, we've had mediums that said they've done that. But I, to know, I, I really don't know 100% that I'll, you know, quote unquote clear. How do you deal with skepticism? Because not everyone's a believer. No, I know. I just, you know, I just try and provide the experiences that I've had and what I've gone through. And that's all I can really do. I can't really attest for anybody else. A lot of TV shows these days on certain channels. Yes. They're called reality TV shows, but. The ones I've seen are anything but reality. Yep. Are these shows an asset to legitimate paranormal groups, or are they a hindrance? Um, I think it makes us look like a joke. I think some of the, not all the shows on TV are, mm -hmm. are saying like that, but there's some shows on TV that are trying to put themselves out as paranormal investigators, and... They don't impress me at all, and I, I think it, it, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth sometimes just because this is what I'm trying to do, and sure. they're out there making us look like a bunch of, you know, jerks. It must be hard, you know, having to put up with these kind of shows that, on television. That, and then, I just, Honestly, I just don't watch them. Smart. Um, geez, I was, I was just going to ask you something, and, and it just... I just lost it. What other uh, oh here? What other aspects of the paranormal do you investigate? Like the paranormal is a big field. Do you just do ghost investigations, or do you investigate cryptids? Do you investigate uh, lake monsters? Do you investigate UFOs? No, unfortunately, it's boring. We just do ghosts. Um, I don't. I I don't honestly like like. I, I don't disbelieve lake monsters or disbelieve Bigfoot, but I haven't explained ghosts before I experienced it. I've never experienced it, so I can't say I can with it. So basically, you only investigate what you yourself have seen or heard? Um, uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay, so uh, I'd just like to go back to the fact that you've gone in, you've done the investigation, you... You determine that there is something there, and and how how do you how do you present the evidence to the homeowners? Do you make a positive identification on who the spirit is? Do Not you... unless I know for sure, which is never the case. So I never can say like, "Hey, this is your grandmother," mm -hmm. or "Hey, this is the guy that used to live here." I just present like what we have and. They 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 can kind of they can take it from there. I don't. I can't offer any further insight of how, who it is. How many paranormal research groups are there in the area of Rhode Island where you live? Uh, there are quite a few. Uh, it's there's a lot of major and minor groups. There's a lot of major groups. You know, there's Rise Up. They're pretty big. Um, Taps is really big. Mm -hmm. um, Rhode Island Paranormal Research Group. There's there's a lot of little groups though. Spread out that are aren't as notice, no, you know, noticeable. Now, do you people share information? Absolutely. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I've I've worked with a few different paranormal groups. I understand. Um, I, I understand that you've uh, gone to Monticello and uh, done research there, and I was wondering if you could share it with us. I I I, I don't think so. I I'm sorry. I, I just never been to Monticello. My father was also a fan of history and and took me across the eastern half of the United States to many historical sites. And then in brackets, you've got Monticello, just to name one of a few. Oh, Monticello. Oh, Thomas. I'm sorry. Thomas Jefferson's home. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I did visit Monticello when I was eight years old. Um, it was impressive because mm -hmm. it was, you know, it was built by Thomas Jefferson. Right. Um, you know, and he was, 
Arch- he was an architecturist, architecture, as well as a politician, as well as uh, an economist. So, um, yeah, he was. It was. I saw a lot of uh, cool historical spots throughout the throughout the country. And amongst uh, other things, he was the first Secretary of State for the United States. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had a wonderful career. If somebody listening tonight would like to become a paranormal investigator, what course of action would you suggest they take? Um, if you can't find a group for yourself, like find a small group around your area to investigate with, I would suggest some places yourself that, you know, it's legal for you to be there. Like the cemeteries are, are you can go there. Um, there's prison that are a little that you can go to during the daytime and just kind of and get your feeling and maybe ask a few questions at a recorder. Mm-hmm. Take a few pictures and see what you get. But it's also very important that if you go somewhere that you have permission to be there and be That's very it. respectful. And, you know, it's, it, at times I find paranormal investigators very rude when it comes to the way they, they treat those who have departed. Like oh, absolutely. Like tantalizing, uh, aggravating taunting yep. yep very disrespectful listen uh, you and i have to take our final break for this hour stand by buddy buddy thayer is our special guest this hour explanation he is the founder and historian of ocean state paranormal and if you'd like to find out more about them visit them on facebook at facebook.com forward slash ocean state paranormal this is the exon i am rob mcconnell and we'll be back on the other side wrapping up this hour as we continue our quest to find out the truth behind the paranormal and parapsychology. We'll be back. Don't go away. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation, the house fights back. He is visited by ghosts of owners past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, opening an old locket, or opening a brand new casket in the basement. These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. 
from Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. Buddy Thayer is our guest this hour, XO Nation. He's the founder and historian of Ocean State Paranormal. And if you'd like to find out more information about Paranormal, I'm sorry, Ocean State Paranormal, visit them on Facebook at Ocean State Paranormal. Buddy, what are your what are your words of wisdom? Your final thoughts for the XO Nation tonight? Uh, words of wisdom. Um. Respect the living, respect the living, respect the dead. Like you said, uh, we absolutely try and do so. Um, don't desecrate, don't destroy, um, and always be safe. Um, thanks for having me too. Well, it's our great pleasure, buddy. Um, this next investigation that you're going to be working on, can you tell us a little bit about it without uh, spilling the beans? Uh, yes, it's a. Um, Colonial home mm-hmm. in Fall River, Massachusetts. Um, it's dated pre-Revolutionary War, so it's dated about 1730, I think it was built. And the original owner owned what's now currently half of about Fall River, half of the city of Fall River. And he donated his land to the cause um, to help help fund the cause against the British. So the, the case involves, like... Um, Phantom footsteps. People have seen like apparitions. Mm-hmm. Uh, people hear noises. So I, I'm I'm excited to go in. Now, is your group the first group to go in? No, we're the third ones to go in. So why would he ha- keep on having different groups in? Because he's a historical uh, society, basically. So he's uh, he, he he's he's letting everybody take a take a taste, I guess. Now, does he charge you entrance fees? Uh, we donate. We will donate money to the uh, society. Now, do you guys charge for your services? No, we do not. So anything, any any money that we have, mm-hmm. any like equipment that we own, we 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 collect dues in the group, and we we pay for it via that way or out of our own pocket. Are there any Are there any paranormal courses that you would recommend? What's that? Paranormal courses. Hmm. Um, I would definitely recommend recommend anybody to take some science courses before you do this. Um, I was always a history guy, so a lot of this was when I first started. It was like uh, you know, it was like Greek to me because I was I was never a science guy. I would definitely take some science courses. So yeah, and maybe take some courses in psychology. Well, isn't a little bit of knowledge more dangerous than a lot of knowledge? And if people just take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, they may not be learning what they need to know. Oh, yeah, find something you're good at, something you like, and then study mm-hmm. that, maybe. Buddy, thanks very much for joining us. And Exo Nation, Buddy Thayer has been our guest this hour. He is with uh, Ocean State Paranormal. The, let me see their Facebook page is Ocean State Paranormal. That was easy. I'll be back on the other side of this news break at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. The X-Zone is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And, you know, you know I, I, I wonder why people with these houses just keep on getting groups to come in and come in and come in. And then, ka money, ka money, ka money. If they were so interested in the historical value of it, number one, you would think that they would get all the information from the first group that went in. And number two, they wouldn't charge these people. But I guess that's why I do radio. I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. <laughs> 